Welcome. This is 49F6, and this is applying Gauss's law to find the electric field, in this case, near a point charge. That's what we're going to do from now on. We're going to use Gauss's law to find point, uh, the electric field at various positions near uh, certain patterns of charge, and the first one is a point charge. We know the answer to this. We've already done it in the previous chapter. But let's, let's use this as a way of learning how to do these things. So we want to find the electric field at this point on the surface, at this point at some location near a point charge. So many centimeters away. And we know already that our E is equal to KEQ over R squared. We know this already, but what we're going to do is we're going to use this to to uh, show how we would generically find these things using Gauss's law. So here's my point of interest. I put a Gaussian surface through it, so I need my Gaussian surface to go through it. So I, in this case, and I, I also want the Gaussian surface to behave uh, well following those rules that we learned previously. So I'm going to use a Gaussian surface which is symmetrical about the charge, it's going to be spherically symmetrical, that means that my electric field is constant on the surface and it also means that because my electric field is radial going through the Gaussian surface, because my area vector is radial from the Gaussian surface, the angle between the electric field and the area vector uh, is zero degrees which makes life much simpler. And what we say is we pick a Gaussian surface that is spherical and symmetrical about Q and the Gaussian surface must have the point of interest as part of it. You can't just ignore the point of interest. So what I say is, oh, Gauss's law. I'll say that my flux is equal to the integral of E dot dA, which equals Q in over epsilon naught. And then I say, well, you know, because the electric field is parallel to the area vector on the Gaussian surface, I can say my flux is equal to the integral of the magnitude of E times the magnitude of dA times the cosine of, in this case, zero degrees, which equals Q in over epsilon naught. And then I say, well, you know, because the electric field is constant on that Gaussian surface, I can say that my, electric, my flux is equal to the, my electric field times the integral of dA. So I take the electric field outside the integral, which equals Q in over epsilon naught. And then from just a visualization, I can say, well, hold on. That integral dA is the surface area of my Gaussian surface. And because I picked a sphere, I know that it's 4 pi r squared. So I can say my flux is equal to E times my 4 pi r squared, which equals Q in over epsilon naught. Then I just rearrange. I say my electric field is equal to Q in over 4 pi r squared epsilon naught over epsilon naught, uh, uh, q in over 4 pi r squared epsilon naught. And then I say, well, because ke is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, then there's a 4 pi and there's an epsilon naught, so I get ke q in over r squared. The same equation that I learned by using the analogy to Newton's gravitational law. And then to get the force and then getting the field from that, if you remember from the previous chapter. Now, if you're in my class, this is, this is the way you do it. I, I ask you a question like this, and then I want these justifications because that's the physics. This is the important bit, actually. How can you justify making that next step? Uh, but this is the pattern we see for these, for these problems. So it's a typical problem. A 10 Coulomb charge is located at the origin. So let's draw ourselves an origin and there's a charge and here's 10, whoops, 10 positive. And using the method of Gauss's law shown in class, determine the field at any point that is three meters from the point charge. So I could imagine this anywhere. I'm gonna imagine my point of interest there, three meters away. And I'm going to therefore say, oh, I need a Gaussian surface which goes through the point of interest, goes through this point P, and has all the advantages of symmetry. So 
I'm going to pick a Gaussian surface which is symmetrical, which is spherical, and that will take me off. Uh, that will get me going. So then I say, well, my flux is equal to the integral of E dotted with dA, which equals Q inside over epsilon naught. There's my Gaussian. There's my Gauss's law. And then I say, well, you know that for this Gaussian surface, for Gaussian surface, E is parallel to dA. So that's going to enable me to expand this and I can go, well, my flux then is equal to the integral of magnitude of E, magnitude of dA, cosine the angle between, which is zero in this case, which equals Q inside over epsilon naught. And because this is the cosine of zero, that equals one. So then I say, ah, oh, but you know, there's another thing I know, which is for Gaussian surface, my E is constant. Because all points on the Gaussian surface are the same distance away from my point charge. So I say, okay, in that case, my flux is equal to E integral dA, which equals Q inside over epsilon naught. And then I say, well, you know, for sphere, Gaussian surface, integral of A is equal to 4 pi r squared. So that gets me my flux is equal to E 4 pi r squared which equals Q inside over epsilon naught. And now I can kind of cut to the chase. I say, well, hold on. That means my E is equal to Q inside over 4 pi r squared times epsilon naught. And then I remember, oh yeah, but you know, Ke is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So that gives me my whoops a daisy. My electric field is equal to Q inside. And then there's four pi and there's epsilon naught. So I can say K E over what's left is R squared. So to write this in the more traditional way, E is equal to K E Q inside over four pi over I'm sorry, R squared. Now let's put some numbers in. So E is equal to, leave the K E alone. Q inside, well it's going to be plus 10 over R squared. R in this case was 3, so that's going to be 3 squared. So that's going to be 10 over 9 K E. And if I get my calculator, that's going to be 1.1. So that's going to be 1.11 Ke Newtons per coulomb. Now, we could have done this using just the equation that we knew from the previous chapter. But by using an example where we know the answer, we can build confidence and know that we're doing these things right. Because in the next section of this chapter, we're going to do uh, uh, some examples where we, we did not know the answer from previous chapters. So if you're in my class, I want to see all those justifications as well. But if you're in anybody's class, you're going to need to be able to work uh, Gauss's law like this. So there we have it.